Hi, everyone. Thank you all. I know it's the end of the day, so I appreciate you all being here. Um, let's just get into it. I'm here today to discuss the business value of privacy. Um, I know many of you know um, privacy as of May 2018 with GDPR, it became major. Um, privacy and data governance is something I've been doing since 2010, um, but I feel like as of 2018 that everyone realized the value of it. Um, so now I just kind of want to inform you, we want to go past the surface. Uh, we know that there are laws, we know about privacy laws. How many of you have heard of GDPR, CCPA? Okay, so we know that there's laws that we have to follow. And we also know, ethically speaking, privacy and protecting people's personal information is the right thing to do. Ethically speaking, it's just what we should be doing. But a lot of people overlook the um, impact that privacy compliance has on the financial health of an organization. We're going to do a quick intro. We're going to get into three C's of the business value of pri um, privacy. We're going to discuss seven data privacy best practices that you can take home to your organization or that you can take notes of and implement it um, to achieve or to try your best to reach privacy compliance. Um, I will say I feel like it's impossible to be completely compliant. Um, but as long as we follow best practices, we show best efforts, uh, you'll be in a good place and you'll reduce your risk of uh, personal information being breached. And finally, we will have our resource page where we can just discuss ways for you to learn more about privacy. How many of you work in privacy? How many of you are interested in pivoting into privacy? Okay, great. So I also have resources for you as well. Um, here's a quick introduction. I graduated from Hampton. Uh, for undergrad in finance, I graduated from Mercer Law School. I'm barred here in Georgia. And because I'm the deputy chief of the, the deputy chief privacy office, deputy chief privacy officer of the CDC, I have to make this statement. Um, these are my views and my views alone, and they do not represent those of the US government, the HHS, or the CDC. So why should you care about privacy? Basically, there are three C's. There are cost savings, customer trust, and the ability to create business opportunities. When we discuss cost savings, we're going to be focusing on breaches, fines, and we're going to be focusing on legal disputes. Focusing first on mitigating data breach expenses. $4.35 million, that's the average cost of a data breach as of 2022. And that is a 2.6% increase from 2021. Companies are spending billions of dollars um, to increase their data protection from training awareness, tabletop exercises, uh, encryption, multi-factor authentication. They're spending billions of dollars because it's gonna save them that much more. 88% um, of company boards now view cybersecurity and privacy as a core business risk and are including privacy professionals and cybersecurity professionals on their boards now. A long time ago, IT was not in the boardroom. Um, testing incident response plans have, are saying, IBM states that testing incident response plans, so like tabletop exercises, going through hypotheticals, going through your incident response plans, and understanding what the stakeholders are supposed to be doing, making sure everyone understands the role of the communications person, the general counsel, the role of the IT person, making sure there's no gaps in the incident, incident response plan. Um, they've spent $2.6 million, an average of $2.6 million in making sure that they know what to do um, if there's an incident or a breach. And this last point just shows that it's the compromise of data credentials that's the number one cause of breach, which is why training, privacy training and awareness is very important in your organization, and it's important that you uh, become a privacy champion in your organization. 
Second to mitigating breach uh, expenses is reducing regulatory fines. Here is a chart showing the largest fines issued for GDPR as of May 2023. So I literally just updated this slide to include the $1.2 billion fine that Meta had to pay for their GDPR uh, violation. So as you can see, if your organization understands data privacy best practices, they can reduce the fines that your organization has to pay in, the ca in case of a breach or incident. Under GDPR alone, uh, fines range from 2% to 4% of uh, your business's annual revenue, revenue for the previous uh, fiscal year. And thirdly, under cost savings, we have legal disputes. How many times have you all provided your email address and you consented to use it maybe to receive a free download? Not realizing that your personal information, your PII, will be used for a completely different purpose. Um, you didn't give consent to use it for that purpose. Lots of organizations have failed at getting fresh consent. They are to use your personal information for um, the purpose that you specified that you gave consent to use it for. Uh, failure to respond to data subject rights. Uh, many people don't realize they have the right to access the data. They have the right to have their data corrected. Um, they may even have the right to be deleted um, under certain privacy laws. And if organizations don't have those uh, data subject rights processes in place, they can be sued. We have inadequate security measures, failures to comply with privacy regulations, so on and so forth. But it's important that people follow these rules because legal disputes are expensive. Lawyers are expensive. And people want to spend more time creating income, marketing, increasing sales versus combating legal disputes. Next, we're going to get into the second C, which is customer trust and loyalty. I have here two quotes. Um, MasterCard's chief marketing and communications officer stated that more than ever, people expect full transparency, control, and choice over how their data is shared and used by companies. And any brands that ignore this shift will be left behind. He noted it was, an, it was an essential for the advertising and marketing industry to take a proactive approach and demonstrate to consumers that big brands respect them and their data. Also, I have a quote from L'Oreal's chief digital officer. She said that while data enables brands to personalize and customize customer experiences, the industry as a whole needs to mobilize to ensure that data collection and use are handled with the highest level of transparency and ethics. Giving customers trust is the number one currency for brands and the reason why we need to rethink data sharing as true value exchange. Many times I go to these conferences and I always hear the same term that uh, data is now, data is the new gold. Data is worth more than oil. Uh, and it's important that these customers, that these organizations, uh, we ensure we have the proper privacy compliance practices in place because we want to retain these customers. We want to have a positive brand reputation and we want to increase the customer acquisition. I know as a parent alone, I'm always looking for privacy conscience, conscious organizations that I know will protect my child and their privacy and their safety. So that, that uh, target audience of parents alone uh, is a multi-billion dollar business. Uh, and parents do not play about their children. <laughs> so imagine the customer trust and loyalty that you can have if you have proper data subject access processes. Just a, a legitimate privacy policy that's not three years old. Uh, simple things like that. Simply providing consent notices every time someone provides you with their data and you using it the way you said you would use it. The third C is capturing business opportunities. Uh, I am the chief, uh, deputy pro de chief deputy privacy officer of the CDC. However, I have a business where I provide uh, privacy services. I would say 80% of my customers are in a hurry. They're in a rush. 
because they're about to miss out on a major opportunity if they don't get their ducks in a row. Jarrell, uh, can you please get my privacy policy together? I'm trying to partner with this big organization, but my privacy policy isn't compliant. Or oh, where can I go to get cyber insurance? I'm gonna miss out. The competitive advantage that you have for having privacy compliance in place is major. If you hear about a breach for a company, that company's competitor is sneaking in right behind them saying, I'm compliant, I have my ducks in a row, I have my data sharing agreements, I can show you where we're using encryption, I can show you where we are uh, sharing people's data ethically. I can show you where our privacy policy is current and we state our data subjects' rights. We state the security functions we have in place. We state exactly what data elements we're collecting, why we're collecting, and we're minimizing the data we're using in order to uh, uh, prevent security breaches for information that doesn't even need to be collected in the first place. So those are the three C's, uh, the three ways that privacy compliance can save money, increase, and retain customers. So you wanna know, how do I do that? Since I know privacy is, is, is so important, what do I do? Here you, you can take these seven best practices to your organization and they're nothing new, it's just a mnemonic to help you remember them help you to become a privacy champion and to help you explain it to others in your organization. Things to keep in mind when you're working day to day because these are global data privacy best practices. It doesn't matter whether you are trying to be compliant with GDPR, CCPA, COPPA, um, HIPAA, it doesn't matter. <laughs> All privacy laws will uh, work with, the, with this framework. Mind yours. We're gonna discuss how to map and minimize data, implementing privacy by design, notifying third parties, employees, and clients, and just transparency in general. We're gonna discuss developing privacy operations, understanding contracting, because as you know, you may hear about all these breaches from the big main company, but you don't even realize sometimes it's the vendor or it's the third party who actually had the breach. Uh, risk assessments and the importance of security function collaboration. Let's start with mapping and minimizing data. I will say the worst feeling in the world is to have a major breach and realize the data that was compromised was data you did not even need. Your retention policy said you should have deleted that data 10 years ago, and now you've just compromised thousands or millions of people information for information you didn't even need. Or the second worst feeling is to have data, comp uh, data compromise that you had no business purpose for. Why did you collect social security numbers? There was no reason to have them. So uh, GDPR actually has a minimization principle that states relevant and necessary information only for specified business purposes. If you violate the minim data minimization principle, uh, that is a major no-no in Europe. And also mapping data or having a data inventory is important. I can't tell you the number of times where our data inventory, which states the type of data we're collecting, names, social security numbers, date of birth, for each system, stating who the data owner is of the system, how the data is flowing, what's the retention policy for each statement, for each uh, system. And then when we hear that a breach occurred for a system, I can look for that system. I can identify whether sensitive data is included in that system and know whether we have to notify people. No, I can know what privacy controls there were. Where, was there encryption? Was there encryption at rest? So I, I can know, oh, okay, this, this may have been a major incident, we may have violated protocol, but there's no need to notify the end users, there's no harm, there's no financial harm, no reputational harm. So a data inventory gives you peace of mind and minimizing data is the, 
is a, a great effective tool at enhancing data security. I, implementing privacy by design. Uh, this is all about starting early and collaborating with privacy SMEs. Uh, you want to find ways to not use personal information if you don't want if you don't have to. When you can use um, anonymized data, uh, when you can use aggregate data. I work for the CDC, and lots of times we use aggregate data for research. We don't need to know whose data it is. We just need the results of the data to make, create our analysis. Um, also, access and correction rights. People want to know what you're doing with their data. They want to know what data you have on them. They want to know, um, they want to tell you that, oh, this is wrong. You should have a process to correct their data. And certain laws require or allow people to be deleted if they want. And you should have those processes in place. And it shows that you have a, a mature privacy compliance program when you have evidence of that and also makes you more competitive uh, from your competitors. It shows that you're an established business and you care about the data you're using. And also, users like consent and controls. I know you all have seen the cookie notices and a lot of you still accept all just to look at your websites. <laughs> But a lot of people don't. I don't. I'm going to restrict. I'm going to say no. Uh, I'm going to uncheck all boxes. OK? But implementing privacy by design is very uh, important because if you do get an access request you, and someone wants to be deleted, if your organization has taken that into consideration and established your systems and know uh, how data is flowing, you're going to get rid of duplicative data. And when you delete someone here, you want to know, OK, do I have to delete them there? Did I delete them in all the places? Do I even know what data we have? How can you follow uh, access, or how can you fulfill the access or a, a deletion request if you don't have a data inventory, if you don't know what data you have? So that leaves you susceptible to fines, uh, legal disputes. Let's move on to in notifying customers, employees, and vendors. CCPA has, uh, is relatively new, but as far as their enforcement is concerned, their most enforced violation of privacy has been privacy policy. People have a non-compliant privacy policies. You should be updating your privacy policy annually. Your privacy policy should state the type of data you're using, collecting, sharing. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a privacy policy, policy that states they're not sharing data, yet they have Google Analytics, yet they're using <laughs> Shopify. You're, sharing, you're not sharing the data with individuals, but you're sharing the data with other organizations. You're sharing the data and people are entrusting you with their data and you're basically misleading them. You're telling them you're not sharing their data. And then they hear about how this other organization that they didn't give their data to had a breach and now they're receiving notice of a breach. Or actually, will they receive notice of a breach? Did you properly document? Uh, so notificate, I, I, went, I started with privacy policy because that's what I see most from smaller businesses. These generic privacy policies are not it. Um, but also data processing agreements, consent forms, fresh consent, which I spoke about, data breach notification. If uh, recently I had a client whose accountant had a breach. So she reached out to me and said, my accountant had a breach. Do I need to notify my clients? Yes. You share their data with your accountant and their data is now floating out in Never Neverland. You need to provide them a notification because they gave you consent. They didn't give your accountant consent. Um, and also data sharing agreements, even render ATL. They booked video, they booked lighting, they booked photography. 
they should have agreements in place saying you don't, saying, telling them how long they can keep this personal information, which our pictures, our face, our videos, that's personal information. Uh, who can they share this data with? Do they have the right to share the data with anybody? Should they only be using it for the specified purpose? How long can they keep this data? Data sharing agreements should be very specific and cover all bases. And also, it should cover subcontractors as well. My company may hire company B, but company B may hire company C to fulfill some of the work as a subcontractor. Data sharing agreements should also fulfill subcontractor control as well and have the ability to fulfill data subject um, rights. And this leads us into understanding contracting. Here, I, I always say it's important that people hire attorneys. I know people have the, um, the online websites where they can get these quick forms. But if you are covered by a privacy regulation, if you're covered by HIPAA, if you're covered by GDPR, if you're covered by CCPA, you should definitely work with an attorney to make sure that you understand if your contracts have the proper data sharing, uh, data protection clauses. And you wanna make sure when you're sharing data and contracting with these people and sharing personal information, you wanna make sure that they have the same technical, administrative, and physical controls for privacy that you have, or better. What's the point of me having cyber insurance and me sharing with this third party and they don't have cyber insurance? What's the point of me having encryption and uh, privacy training annually for my employees and the people I'm sharing their data aren't? You wanna make sure that you're sharing data with reputable companies, and that also comes back to the competitive advantage People aren't gonna work with you if you don't have these, the proper controls in place. And also auditing and compliance monitoring is important because when sharing data, you may not know what this third party does. You may not know if they're making false claims that they have the ducks in the row. But don't be afraid to ask for proof of audit. Don't be afraid to ask for compliance monitoring to make sure that they're doing what they say they're doing, to make sure that they are just as compliant as you are. Risk assessments. Um, under GDPR, which is one of the strictest privacy policies, privacy impact assessments are, are DPIAs, data protection impact assessments, are required um, for special category systems, systems that have um, race, racial information, financial information, health information, things that can cause a uh, high risk of harm financially, uh, health-wise or reputationally wise. That's not a word, but based on reputation. And um, in the government, I, I'm, we're governed by the Privacy Act of 1974, so we do privacy impact assessments on almost all systems that have personal information. And what they do is uh, they, are basically questionnaires to assess systems and determine do you have the proper controls in place. And if you don't, this you should get more. You should have, you're collecting social security numbers, oh, you should have encryption, you should have this, you should have that. Um, how can people opt out? Who are you training this data with? What are the privacy, what are the administrative controls, which could be training annually, um, auditing, uh, awareness programs, SOPs, um, what are your physical controls? Physical controls are important. Lock doors, gates, guards, um, things like that people may not think about. I, I worked with a dental office. Their administrative and their, their uh, technical controls were fine, but they, their physical controls were lacking. We had, let's get locked cabinets and locked doors with keys, <laughs> not the twisty one, because you're, that's mental health information, uh, PHI, regular health information, needs to be protected. It requi they require controls as well. I know people hear controls and it sounds so technical, but no, physical controls are just as important. Finally, security functions. 
Working with our security is key. We collaborate all the time. Incident sharing, sharing threat intelligence, leveraging their, their funds, their budget, because privacy, we're usually tasked with doing more with less, and security gets way more coins than we do. So it's great to be able to leverage their budget, but for them to be able to use our intelligence to um, collaborate on risk assessments and training and awareness programs. So th th this is basically the Mind Yours framework, which works for any privacy law. You can quote me on that. Any, I guarantee, um, or I will give you a free Starbucks or something. But uh, that's my time. Here are resources. IAPP.org has a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of free knowledge, and they also have a small business advisor and a privacy advisor, and their information is up to date. Like, as soon as something happened, I'm getting an email about a new privacy law, a new privacy incident, a new fine that was enforced. Um, and also, I provide, uh, you can go to yourcpo.com or my name, jarelloshody.com, if you want to uh, talk to me about anything regarding pivoting into privacy, if you're interested in getting to, into privacy, or if you want to discuss uh, me or my uh, team providing workshops, trainings, or data privacy best practice, uh, tabletop exercises, and also anyone who works with organizations in Europe, it, you should look at, check out GDPR guidance um, at the European Data Protection Board. And also, uh, IAPP has a blog that has great information and a list of uh, vendors, and consultants that are so helpful and accessible. So thank you, that is my time. Uh, feel free to email me, jarell at jarelloshody.com, and I appreciate you.